This lecture series was created by the current board members of the New Canaan Library to honor the ongoing work and dedication of a former trustee. The nominated former trustee will share a lecture that he or she believes will engage, interest, and enrich the members of our community. We are thrilled that Kevin Seth has brought Dr. Azra Razra, Dr. Raza Azra to us today. It's awesome. Speaking for both Kevin and myself, I think the most rewarding part on serving on the board for the last six years has been the chance to be a part of the incredible development of our new library. I am thrilled to report that we have raised over $16 million and are moving forward on the next step in the fundraising. If you have not had a chance to watch the video detailing the plans for the new building, please go to the New Canaan Library website and do so, because I know once you see them, you'll want to join us in making the incredible new library a reality for our town. And now, I would like to introduce Kendra Seth. Yay! Well, I, I concur what Holly said, such an amazing turnout. So thank you all so much for being here on a blustery January night. It's great to see so many familiar faces. Uh, truly, this is my two worlds coming together. Uh, fortunately for me, this time it's on my home turf, uh, Dr. Osra's, Osra Raza's. Um, I promise you uh, this will be time well spent. For those of you who, like myself, have been affected by cancer or love someone who has, your time tonight will be so worthwhile. It's the best thing you can do to support yourself, to support those that you love, uh, is to hear what Dr. Raza has to say. I originally met Dr. Raza because she was a patient, my mother was a patient of hers. Although my beautiful mom ultimately succumbed to MDS nearly five years ago, or three years ago, we have Dr. Raza to thank for the extra five years with her, um, truly extending her life far beyond her original diagnosis. In addition to being a best-selling author, Dr. Raza's day job is the director of MDS Center at Columbia University. She is a leading expert in MDS patient care and clinical research in the country. No one knows more about cancer, personally or professionally, than Osra. She has dedicated her life to her patients and to the science of finding better treatments and ultimately a cure. It is my great pleasure to introduce my amazing doctor, my cherished friend, Dr. Osra Rossi. Thank you very much, Kendra. Thank you to the New Canaan Public Library. I'm deeply honored to be able to speak to you today. Thank you to Kevin and Kendra, to the extended family who's all, I see many faces. It's really amazing how the Freehill family has continuously <coughs> supported me also in all these years since I have known them. And speaking of families, I'm very fortunate today because my daughter, Shahrazad, is here. <laughs> it's very special when a daughter takes her mother seriously. <laughs> you know what Nora Ephron said, that if you have a teenager in the house, you must always also have a dog, so someone will listen to you. <laughs> But I recall on January 1st, 2000, the turn of the millennium, my late husband Harvey and I were having a very serious conversation. This is the millennial starting, it's January 1st, what should be our resolutions? And at that point, seven-year-old Shahrazad happened to walk in. And Harvey turned to her and he said, darling, would you have any New Year resolutions? It's a start of a new century. And without batting an eyelid, she goes, yes, I have, actually. Mm. Number one, be nice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Number two, she said, give more to charity mm -hmm. from daddy's money. <laughs> <laughs> and number three, she said, mommy, do not give me so many math questions to solve. I don't want to become as smart as daddy. Then I only talk about work, mm -hmm. never have fun. Mm -hmm. I want to be like you, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, listen to what she says. I want to be like you, mommy, a little dumb. <laughs> Maybe 
I'd like to dedicate this afternoon to Barbara Freehill, beloved wife of George Freehill, mother to Kelly, Evan, Kendra, and Kim, grandmother to many beautiful children here. I had the great privilege of being her oncologist for many years. Barbara was sophisticated and charming. She laughed easily, she dressed beautifully, she was kind and generous and loved playing golf and throwing parties. Barbara and I spent many, many years meeting regularly in clinic, and that meant after our medical business of the day was done, we would then indulge in personal stories. And she recounted many, many anecdotes to me about her wonderful childhood, about Billy Crystal, about all that jazz, about her parents and growing up here. Above all, it became very clear to me how much she adored her family, especially her grandchildren. She handled her long chronic illness, which came with its own unique set of challenges. And these were some roller coaster challenges, frequent blood transfusions, participations in one clinical trial after another. And yet the jagged toxicities of these she suffered with utmost poise and composure. She always had hope and she did everything possible to help herself live the quality of life that she valued. And when the end came, Barbara was amazing in that she accepted that too with sublime equanimity. She opted for hospice care, wishing to meet her end at home in Florida. We kept talking on the phone many times, even in the last couple of days we had many conversations. I was so affected by how gracefully she was handling her terminal illness. It reminded me very much of what the great Emily Dickinson imagined her end to be. That death comes almost as a gentleman caller to escort her. Because I could not stop for death, he kindly stopped for me. The carriage held but just ourselves, mm -hmm. an immortality. <clears throat> we slowly moved, he knew no haste, and I had put away my labor and my leisure too for his civility. To Barbara Freehill and to her fantastic family, I'm really, really honored to be here as their guest and as the guest of the library. Thank you very much. I was going to start by requesting Kendra to read a passage from the book that she has written. Can you hear me? I was admitted through the ER for a pain I was experiencing on my right side. I thought maybe I had pulled a muscle running. That pain quickly went from mild to excruciating. After a long night, a CAT scan revealed that I had a massive clot in my portal vein. The clot was virtually strangling all of the blood flow to my major organs. In order for me to survive, the clot had to be cleared as quickly as possible. After three failed surgeries and little hope for a plausible next step, my mom suggested that her doctor stop in for a visit. I begged my mom not to. After the failure of my best chance surgery, I was at an all-time low, both mentally and physically. My body seemed to go in complete, into complete revolt. Although I hadn't eaten in weeks, I gained over 30 pounds of water weight, virtually overnight. I couldn't bend my fingers or toes or even roll over. I was literally a prisoner in my own bed. Mentally, I just could not wrap my head around how a year ago I had successfully climbed Mount Kilimanjaro mm -hmm. and how my life could so have dramatically changed in a number of months. Mm -hmm. The last thing I wanted was another team of doctors that only asked to sit the same questions but provided no answers. Mm -hmm. And then I met Dr. Raza. At the time she walked through the door, they were discussing my best option, which was a five-organ transplant. Mm -hmm. 
All I could think of about that point was getting home to my husband and my four children. And so I was all for it. It just shows you how desperate I felt. When Dr. Raza quietly came in, she didn't ask me all the usual questions. She spoke to me as a person and not a case. Her humanity was immediately apparent. Dr. Raza and her team suggested I be tested for a mutation of JAK2. And when that came back positive 10 days later, that was the first breadcrumb to getting me healthy again. Mm. I wanted to start with this note of optimism, and uh, this is a book about optimism and the vision for the future. So the reason is that here is a young woman who at the time was 39 years old, mother of four young children, mm. who was about to have a five organ transplant, mm. and yet by finding that one mutation, the majority of patients, all they need is a baby aspirin a day. <laughs> because of very high platelet count, there were lots of clots forming and blocking blood supply to her organs, which would die without blood supply. But once we discovered the cause, giving baby aspirin meant that it would act like a blood thinner. Mm -hmm. So the point uh, that Kendra has made in the book beautifully is how important it is for us to understand the reason behind what we are dealing with. Mm -hmm. uh, the answers can come much faster. As Einstein said, if I'm given a, a problem to solve, he said, I would, if I'm given one hour to solve a problem, I would spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes about the solution. And that's literally what happened here. And we are so delighted that things Thank you. have turned out beautifully. Mm -hmm. And we also saved uh, you from undergoing a transplant. Yes, not another one. year later. So yes, <laughs> yes. Thank so uh, thank you very much for doing that and setting the stage for this. Please. So we, I was just going to start with a few questions, and then we were going to open it up to hear some questions from I'm the just audience. going to move this down. Yes, um, I can't see you. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Kendra is tall, but I'm a shrimp. Yeah. <laughs> Given who you're sharing the stage with, and that we are an audience of non-medical professionals, can you tell us in layman's terms what cancer is and how we arrived at the treatments that we have today? Uh, in um, this will be cancer 101. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a very good question actually to start with because if we look back into history and if we even go beyond history and look into paleoanthropology, for example, we find that tumors have been discovered as far back as in dinosaurs. Mm. But the first recorded description of cancer was noted with uh, Etossa, who was a Persian queen, the eldest daughter of uh, Cyrus the Great, mm. and a wife of uh, Darius. She married her brother, as was the custom. So she was uh, reigning 500 years before Christ. She noted one day a bleeding lump in her breast. Mm. And this has been described in history. She noted this lump, and obviously, given who she was, all sorts of physicians from across the continent would have flocked to her bedside, but somehow she was embarrassed by it. So she hid that and covered it with sheets. But it kept growing, and one day she ordered her Greek slave to slice it off. And that is and she survived the mastectomy that he simply put his sword and sliced it off. And this is the first description. We didn't even have a name for this. So 100 years later, then Hippocrates comes along, and he gives it a name, Carcinos, which is Greek for crab. He called it cancer a crab. Why crab? People have speculated on why he did it, but the most uh, accepted idea is that, first of all, uh, cancer, when it's a solid tumor, the, it, it's very hard. It feels like the shell of a crab. Mm -hmm. Secondly, it can be extremely painful, and the sting of a crab can be very painful. And finally, remember when a crab stings you, it does, refuses to let go. Mm -hmm. So that's also another property of cancer. For those reasons, 
the tumor started being called cancer. But imagine that the first mastectomy was really done in 500 BC. We are basically doing the same thing today. And the treatment for cancer started with this kind of slashing. And, um, and the idea was that the more tissue you can remove, the more you have a chance of curing. And so uh, Halstead, who is doing all the mastectomies in the late 1800s, um, he would do what is known as a radical mastectomy. It wasn't until 1940s that women began to question even that why is so much tissue, the entire muscle and half the shoulder, why is everything being removed? But even then it took another 40 years <coughs> till a randomized trial was done in 1980s to show that a simple mastectomy with dissection of lymph nodes is as good as a radical mastectomy. So the, really the um, basis for all treatment for cancer for all these years, centuries, had been surgery. Until the Second World War. During the Second World War, chemicals were produced for chemical warfare. And nitrogen mustard was produced in barrels upon barrels. And there's one city, Bari, in Italy, where it was also dropped. And they noted that individuals who were present in that city, um, their blood counts dramatically went down. So they knew that this chemical had an effect on the body. And Paul Ehrlich, the great scientist and physician, had been fantasizing all this time about somehow poisoning a tumor. And he got the idea that why not use these, uh, these chemicals to give to the body, but uh, you have to draw that fine line between killing the tumor and not killing the patient. Because all of these chemicals that we use to treat the chemotherapy cannot distinguish between normal and cancerous cells. So it's like a sledgehammer, they'll kill everything. The first chemotherapies then were really given in the 1950s. And these were all derived from nitrogen mustard. So cytoxin, for example, which is used today in lymphomas. Um, chlorambucil that my late husband Harvey received for his chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is, these are used, these are the mainstays of most lymphoid malignancies. And third, melphalan also derived directly from nitrogen mustard, which is used today. It is the backbone for preparing patients for a bone marrow transplant. Which reminds me that I'm sitting in a very historic town today because this is where Miss Kathy Juicy is from. Mm -hmm. One of my heroes, and I'm sure the hero of many people in this room, she has really created history in this place. She developed, uh, as you well know, the story, uh, the disease called multiple myeloma, which is a disease of the bone marrow, and she refused to accept the death sentence that was given to her lying down. And she fought for it, not just for herself, but for cancer patients all over. And today, thanks to her, multiple myeloma patients are living four times longer than before. <coughs> When I was in training and I did my fellowship, uh, multiple myeloma was uh, treated by giving heavy body radiation. This is literally like dropping an atom bomb on you. Wow. It was so terrible what we, 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 we were doing because we were desperate. And it's a very painful, uh, terrible death from this disease. But thanks to the money and the resources and the doctors, the intellectual resources that Miss Kathy Juicy was able to um, align together, bring together, and inspire people to come together, um, she's a force of nature. Really. And I'm so, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. And I wish she was here today, but please be sure to tell her that uh, she has a lot of fans in oncologists. <laughs> and I think that Mary Lasker and Kathy Juicy's names will go down in history together. Mm. So anyway, what I was saying was that these drugs that were developed that Ms. Juicy received, the same mm. treatment for her preparation for the bone marrow transplant that she eventually had to undergo, these are being used today. In fact, the drugs I was using in 1977 to treat acute myeloid leukemia, the two drugs, 
uh, popularly known as seven and three, because it's seven days of one and three days of another. I'm still using the same two drugs today in 2020 to treat acute myeloid leukemia. Which means that since I see 30 to 40 cancer patients every week, I have been doing it for more than 35 years now. Think of the conversations that I've had since 1977 to today, repeatedly the same conversations expecting the same dreadful results. Mm -hmm. But if you ask me today, Dr. Raza, if you have acute myeloid leukemia, what would you do for yourself? Mm -hmm. I would take that treatment too. Mm -hmm. Because it's the only treatment that's offering us a chance. Mm -hmm. At least one third of the patients would be alive for five years. And there are always unicorns that will uh, basically um, surprise us all and will unexpectedly live for years and years. Mm -hmm. And I will take that chance myself. So please don't think for a second that I'm against treatment. It's not that. What I'm questioning is something very different, which we'll come to. In 1960s, radiation therapy was added. So now if you go back and think about, OK, cancer, we became aware of it in 500 BC. It was slashed at that time. Today, we are still slashing it. In 1950s, we started using chemotherapy. We are using the same chemotherapy today, mm -hmm. 70 years later. Mm -hmm. How much money have we spent really in uh, research and trying to develop new therapies? Um, hundreds of billions of dollars. What have they yielded? Why are we still using slash, poison, and burn? It's like taking a baseball bat to a dog to get rid of its fleas. It's very painful to get uh, this kind of uh, treatment. So I think it's very important for us to appreciate the fact uh, that cancer is uh, a brutal disease. We have, we have made progress, but not as much as we should have. So what are the causes of cancer? What causes cancer? There are four main things that you should just remember. Either it can be familial, but this is very rare. <coughs> Heredity thing is, is really extremely rare. Environmental exposure, another possibility. Pathogens, meaning a virus can cause hepatic <coughs> cancers by a virus, cervical cancers by a virus or even a bacteria, H. pylori can cause stomach cancer. Uh -huh. So pathogens is number three. And number four, 90% patients, idiopathic. Meaning we don't know the cause. It isn't that they don't have a cause. They could be viruses, they could be bacteria, they could be other ex uh, <coughs> toxic agents. We just aren't smart enough to have unraveled or understood them yet. This is, this is the main problem. So, I hope this answers your question in, I mean, without going into scientific jargon, I want just all of us to understand that it's a serious problem. Mm -hmm. Here is cancer. Why aren't we able to develop? Why haven't we been able to do better? And, uh, and it's not that people are not living longer. It's not that mortality from cancer is not going down. We'll come to that, um, I hope during the course of this conversation. Certainly. That's so heartbreaking to hear that we're still using the same drugs and how little progress has been made. What is the future of treatments? You know, where do we go from here? And what, you know, what would you like to be able to tell your patients or present your patients with? Yeah. So this would make me step back for a moment and tell you that because we think there are these four causes, possibly hereditary, environmental exposure, pathogens, and we don't know what it's all about. Well, scientists decided to put all these four things together. And they said no matter what is the driving force, the cause behind it, the way cancer actually happens is that uh, the cell becomes rogue and starts misbehaving. It uh, escapes the signals of growth that are normally should be controlling it. And so all of that is done by genes. So it has to be a genetic disease. And this is why our focus for all of science became an examination of, uh, of the genes and what, uh, what has gone wrong. 
And the first question that was asked was, okay, if it is a genetic problem, then is one gene involved or more? Mm. And you won't believe that so quickly we found that there were two cancers in which only one gene was involved. One was chronic myeloid leukemia and the other is acute promyelocytic leukemia. One gene, one abnormal protein, one magic bullet to target and it is leading to cures. Chronic myeloid leukemia cured with imatinib. When I was in training and in my early part of the career in the early 80s, this was a vicious malevolent disease that killed universally fatal illness because the chronic le leukemia relentlessly became acute and killed the patient. Right. Today, we at the chronic phase stage, one pill a day and it is cured. Mm -hmm. But the same pill is completely useless as the disease accelerates towards mm -hmm. leukemia. So the earlier you catch, the better. Same thing for acute promyelocytic leukemia, one uh, vitamin A analog, uh, Atra, is curing this disease. So while these two cancers were fantastic successes in terms of treatment, they also put the field behind by years because mm. it, they established a paradigm as if all we have to do now is for pancreatic cancer, find that one gene, for breast cancer, find that one gene. But the more we look, we couldn't find what we found eventually was that there are hundreds and hundreds of genes gone wrong, abnormally functioning in all other cancers. Wow. And this has been the problem. Mm. Not only that many genes are mutated, but also that it's a moving target. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? <coughs> Just remember one thing about cancer. Everything begins in one cell. You have 37 trillion cells in your body. One cell goes rogue. Mm -hmm. And this cell develops such a life of its own that it starts dividing very quickly. So normally if that organ, for example, the liver, the cell would take a week to go from one cell to two cells in the liver, mm -hmm. uh, normally a cancerous liver cell will become two cells in 24 hours. Uh -huh. So it's really... It's a, it has accelerated its speed for doubling. So it has to double its DNA very quickly to divide. And doubling of DNA under normal conditions undergoes certain errors because those errors are made normally. And if they are made in, in genes which are vital to the function, then there are surveillance mechanisms within the cell which make it commit suicide because something bad has happened. Mm. If it happens in a cell, in a gene that is not that important, then we just keep it in our body and it keeps dividing. But cancer cells are dividing so rapidly, they keep making DNA errors, which are, which means mutations. Mm. And these mutations keep piling up. So when one cancer cell divides and becomes two cancer cells, there are potentially now two new cancers. Uh -huh. This divides into two, so it's a moving target. Let's say today I have breast cancer, I take my tumor out, take it mm. to my lab to study those cells and find the perfect drug for it. It took me six weeks to do that. When I come back to give that drug to me, in six weeks the cancer has moved on. Mm. I developed the drug when the cancer was at this stage. Now there are so many more mutations. Mutations may not affect many serious things like the doubling time of the tumor, but they can affect how drugs are metabolized. So the same drug that would have worked six weeks ago will not work now. So what I'm telling you is that it's such a complicated problem. It's not like we're not trying. It's not like resources haven't been committed. There are hundreds of thousands of researchers me too included. Every criticism that I'm giving in the book or right now is directed at me as well. This is why I see it is a complete embarrassment for me to be sitting mm. in, the, uh, in my uh, clinic and offering the same 7 and 3 to patient after patient for all these years and not having something better. I just told you my daughter Shehzad is here. Uh, three years ago, her 22-year-old best friend, uh, Andrew, just developed weakness in his arm, taken to the emergency room. 
they find a nine centimeter tumor in his mm. brain which is inoperable. Mm. The first thing Andrew says when he wakes up to his mother is, Mom, don't worry, just call Asra. <laughs> She'll find a cure for me, don't worry. And that was the most sobering moment for me. Shahrzad Shahir, took me to see him as he had come out and was in the ICU. And he was so confident in me that I don't have to worry about anything he kept telling. Asra is here. How ashamed I felt because from day zero, every one of his oncologists knew that there is 0 0.00 hope for this young man. But what did we do to him for the next 16 months before he died? Surgery upon surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, immune therapy, targeted therapies, more surgery, more chemo, more immune. But we kept doing this to him. Poor boy is quadriplegic. He cannot uh, see. He becomes blind. He cannot move anything except fingers of one hand. In, in a final insult, he can't even swallow. And Shahrzad called me one night completely hysterical, saying, Mommy, I had heard all my life that you and Dad helped cancer patients. Mm. Why aren't you helping Andrew? And she said, how is it possible that Andrew's mother and grandmother have been cured of cancer? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. These are the things that have really stopped me dead in my track, mm -hmm. to, um, to really say, OK, what can we do differently then? So all I'm saying now to you is that for the last 70 years, our approach has been try and kill the last cancer cell. Mm. Remember what I said about surgery, that they kept extending more and more radical surgery to try and get every last cancer cell. Mm -hmm. Then we added radiation therapy and chemotherapy, try and kill more cancer cells. All the time we are chasing the last cell. Why not go for the first cell? And it's not a new idea. In 1907, Dr. Childe made this pronouncement that it's not cancer that kills. It's the delay in treatment. In fact, in 1940s, there were armies of women who would be going around saying, check, get yourself checked out because cancer <coughs> Delayed cancer treatment kills. And we put in screening measures 50 years ago into practice, whether it is through colonoscopy, mammography, pap smears, or PSA tests, etc. These were all geared to try and find cancer earlier and earlier. And as a result, what has happened is that in the last 30 years, the mortality from cancer, the death from cancer, has been going down by 1% a year. So today we can claim proudly that cancer mortality is down 27%. <clears throat> but as a result of what? Two things. One, anti-smoking campaign. They started to have the effect finally. And two, because we are diagnosing cancer earlier and earlier and treating it earlier. But treating with what? Same old, same old again. Today the results are fabulous that 68% of all cancers that are diagnosed today, 68%, that's like two thirds, are cured. And that's something to be proud of, yes. The 32% that are not cured, their outcome is exactly the same as it was 50 years ago. So where has all this money gone? We, as I said, it's not like we haven't tried. First, we were looking for genes. Then we started uh, looking for oncogenes. Then we started looking for how to choke off the blood supply in the 1990s. Then we said, no, let's sequence the human genome. And that took another good 15 years. And we were greatly hopeful that once the genome is sequenced, we will be able to identify all the things that have gone wrong. And, and fix those mutations. Now it's been 20 years since the human genome was sequenced. Where is the cancer solution? 
all that has happened is that we have now, we keep bringing experimental drugs to the bedside which have been developed in the laboratory, testing on animal models um, or using patient cells in vitro even directly, but brought to the bedside drugs that showed 100% cure in mice have a 95% failure rate in humans when they are brought to living people. The 5% that are approved, in my opinion, should have failed anyway because they only prolong survival by a couple of months for a fraction of patients but cause immense physical toxicity and financial toxicity. 42% of all cancer patients diagnosed today in America, 42% <clears throat> lose every penny of their life savings by two plus years. This is unconscionable and it is untenable, it is unsupportable going forward. We need a better answer. And one of the things is that, like everything else in a capitalist society, it has become a business. So cancer is one of the biggest businesses. And there are non-profit cancer centers um, for example, MD Anderson is a non-profit cancer center. In 2010, they made a profit of $510 million. Now, they have no shareholders to distribute it to. So what should they do with that money? They buy more hospitals around and give themselves, the, the businessmen running the institution will give themselves big raises and millions and millions of dollars in benefits. And who is paying for all of this? Um, I'm not making up, you can't make up these statistics. What I'm doing is quoting to you Stephen Brill's article, which came on the cover of Time magazine. It was a 35-page article, published a few years ago. Where is the outrage? Why isn't the public demanding better? Because we are desperate. We, Cancer is becoming more and more of a problem. <clears throat> one in two men and one in three women will get cancer. We are all scared. We don't want to go that way. So all we can do is trust the doctors to do the right thing by us. Like I told you earlier, if I have cancer today, no matter what kind it is, I will take the same treatment because I want to give myself that chance. So we are all desperate. Well, this is now. Can we imagine something better for the future? This is why I wrote the book, The First Cell. And in this book, each chapter is devoted to telling you the story of a patient. Those patient stories are, of course, not easy to read. And once I started writing in great detail about the patients, I realized that if I held back my own story and didn't talk about Harvey, that would be insincere and dishonest. It has now been 18 years since Harvey died, but I've never, never spoken to anybody about it. In fact, my family members are shocked at reading what we lived through. But what forced me to write about Harvey in such granularity is again because it's important to realize what the patient's suffering has been and the anguish that the families go through. And the idea is not to revel in pain, but the idea is to liberate ourselves from the past and be ready to move forward. Mm -hmm. If this is what we are doing to the Andrews and Harveys and Omers of, uh, uh, from this book, how can we do better for the future? Somehow there, there seems to be a misconception that I'm either against cancer treatment or I'm trying to divert cancer uh, research money from one place to another. Um, it's completely wrong. I'm just saying let's take the blinders off our eyes and see the situation for what it is. Instead of proclaiming from the rooftops that a two-month improvement in survival is a game changer. <laughs> It's not the paradigm shift we want to see. So how should we do better? Maybe try something else. The only thing that has worked is early detection. Mm -hmm. But what are the methods we are using for early detection right now? Mammography, extremely painful, by the way. 
<laughs> the women will all sympathize with you. Um, but it's a great thing. Don't let me discourage you from getting mammograms. Uh, but it can miss cancers. Why? Because it's only being done once a year on women. A lot can happen within that year. So 40%, uh, 91% women diagnosed with breast cancer today will live for five years. But the 40% who are diagnosed with advanced cancer will eventually die from it. And that is too high a number. That means 45,000 women a year are dying from breast cancer. So how good is mammography then? It's missing a lot. Um, pap smears save lives. They are, they are the one huge success story. PSA, again, we have taken, performed too many radical prostatectomies and surgeries on men for a little increase in PSA. It's not the best guide for how to really deal with these cancers. And the last one really gives me a headache. Imagine in this day and age, taking a tube, putting it into somebody's gut and looking for a tumor. I mean, this is the day and age of cell phones and technology where my neighbor, where I live, they're a wonderful gay couple. So they had come over to have a drink the other day, and I said, what do you, what do, you do? And they were telling me they're architects. So I said, tell me something completely new about what architects are doing. And they said, well, in Florida, we are building homes where you walk into the living room, and your vital signs appear in front, <laughs> on the wall. So you don't even have to be wearing anything. There are sensors built in that will get, uh, you know, scan you for blood pressure and your heart rate and your uh, respiratory rate, <laughs> uh, cholesterol levels will show up. Uh, no, so this is the advanced technology that we are talking about today. My plea is that instead of screening people once a year using technology that a lot of it has not been as helpful, a lot of it has been, but it can be improved. We should be treating the human body, as my friend Dr. Sam Gambir, who's the head of the Canary uh, Center for Early Detection at Stanford, as he says, we should treat the human body as a machine and monitor it constantly for the appearance of disease. And screening measures have to be developed in line with the technological advances we have today. So when Kendra asked me, I'm sorry, it's taking me so long to come back to answering your question, is what do I envision for the future? Well, first think about who would have thought that if a young man, 22 years old, has pain in his arm, that it is an inoperable breast cancer. Who thinks of these zebras? No one. But it proves the point that no age is immune from cancer, right? Mm -hmm. It means we can't decide that we we'll only uh, monitor people after 60 years of age because cancer is a disease of the aging. No, we need to monitor from birth to death, mm -hmm. everybody, and not just for cancer, for all kinds of chronic diseases, whether it's Alzheimer's or neurologic disease or there has been a 70% decline in mortality from cardiac disease. Why? Because cardiologists were smarter than us. They realized that what you need to do is catch it early and nip it in the bud. So not only did they start doing coronary artery bypasses, stenting, fixing coronaries, they started preventing coronary disease by statins, lowering the cholesterol. And the same thing, the only one, uh, one thing that has doubled human lifespan in the last century is antibiotics. Antibiotics started treating infectious diseases so effectively that our life expectancy went from 40s to 80s, 70s now or 80s in very advanced countries. And yet the real revolution of infectious disease is not antibiotics or antiviral, but vaccines. You don't even think about diseases that when, when my husband, Harvey, was growing up in Brooklyn, all summer they had to be taken away because the parents were so scared they would get polio. Mm -hmm. And how many of his friends ended up on the iron lung? Mm -hmm. 
And yet today, you don't, anyone who invested in iron lung is bankrupt yeah. uh, for a very good reason. So the point I'm making is it's always in every disease, early detection, prevention. That's the answer. Why shouldn't we do the same for cancer? And we can, the way I envision it is, we should treat the human body as if it's a machine and start monitoring it from, uh, for continuous monitoring. I'm working with biomedical engineers at Columbia University where um, we are working on developing implantable devices that could go under the skin mm -hmm. at birth and constantly uh, scan mm -hmm. and survey and carry on surveillance for the appearance of the first cell. Mm -hmm. And so, just like that, we can uh, start with detecting. Um, let me just uh, end by saying that we, if we treat the whole cell, then we have to look for cancer cells, but also what it's producing in terms of RNA, DNA, protein. And there are people doing this. We can start monitoring for all of these things continuously from blood, sweat, tears, saliva, from um, stool and urine. You can and, and use imaging and scanning devices. You can go to sleep using bed sheets that will scan you overnight for the appearance of body areas. Uh, you sit on a fit loo which takes part of your urine and examines it for the biomarkers. You can wear, women can wear a smart bra. This is under investigation and clinical trial now. You put on the bra for two hours a week and it scans you for the appearance of, uh, of, of the person. So it's all these kinds of exciting things. We need that uh, shift from developing experimental drugs that we know have a 95% failure rate continuously and try to use the limited resources we have more intelligently and develop technology that detects the first cell. Amen. is so many books in one and I remember when you first told me you were going to be writing a book and then I felt like it was a couple months mm -hmm. later and I received the galley and when I spoke to you I said how did you possibly write something like that so quickly you told me your daughter said to you you didn't write it you downloaded it you obviously <laughs> been thinking of it for so long and there's so many personal stories heartbreaking stories Andrew Omar my mom Harvey if you could take off your doctor hat for a moment, and as a as a mother, as a wife, how did you respond when cancer entered your family, and what gave you comfort to be on the other side of the table? Yes, that's a beautiful question, and you know what, um, Kendra, I think uh, I spoke for too long already because <laughs> you should open this to other questions. But I'd like to answer your question as well. Uh, if we have permission, but uh, let's open to the audience as well. Sure. What do you think? Absolutely. Oh, you go ahead. Yeah. You are I should be dead twice. A <laughs> uh, PSA saved my life, and uh, a dermatologist saved my life. Now, you're, you're, what you say makes sense to me. Go back and start early and so forth. I have, uh, I think, a very good. Uh, primary care physician, what do you say to her? I think that you brought up a very important point that uh, everything starts with a primary care physician. And congratulations to you that uh, your cancers were picked up early and that you have survived two of them. And that's uh, the kind of story that gives us helium to our spirit and keeps it soaring. Uh, so thank you for sharing that. Uh, two, I can't say anything should be done differently right now because we don't have the correct uh, technology developed yet. So all I'm going to say to the primary care physician is thank you for your service. Continue to do what you're doing for your patients. Keep your eye, eyes out and try to support more and more um, detection and, and, and research that is trying to um, identify the earliest perturbations in networks that are associated with diseases of all sorts. Mm -hmm. Mm 
And so we should really all be supporting that. Your primary care physician should encourage all her patients to participate in the trial that's going on nationally right now called All of Us. Mm -hmm. Just go to allofus.org, offer to participate in it, and they will start following all your blood and urine and all kinds of things. And then 20 years later, it may not help us, but it will help the future generations. Because 20 years down the line, I may develop, uh, let's say, pancreatic cancer. But if I'm being followed from now on by my primary care physician, then I would be detected. Uh, then retrospectively, people would be able to go back and see, ah, the first sign appeared in her blood or in the urine at such and such early stage. So I do think that for your primary care physician has done a great job taking care of you, but being aware of all the national studies that are working towards early detection and, and screening and monitoring devices are very important. And we have time for one more question. Oh, okay. yes. Hi, I have a question. Um, my mom has pancreatic cancer and the one of the markers for that is this the CA19-9. I'm sure you know about that. And I guess when pancreatic cancer is so difficult to detect, why would that not be part of a, a comprehensive blood test? Is I guess it's just a question I have. Like, why don't they just test for that? It seems like it would be such an easy way to find it earlier. Test when, test who, test the whole country from birth to death. Is it a yearly? Is it monthly? Those are the questions. Mm -hmm. And it's not 100%. Uh, CA99 is not uh, only in pancreatic cancer. It can be in other uh, uh, problems as well. So it's not that easy. We have a couple of markers, CEA, CA125, C, the one you mentioned, CA19. But these are, the idea is, how do you monitor for them continuously? So I think tests are being developed uh, that will do it. And um, I am very hopeful for the future. Did you have a question? I was just, I'm so sorry. You are looking at me. Yeah? Oh, okay. Sorry. I, uh, my understanding is that um, I had thought good progress had been made with immunotherapy treating various kinds of cancer. So if you could please define for us what is immunotherapy, and if that is true, that it, it is actually um, effective in certain cancers. Yeah. That's an excellent question. Um, immune therapies attempts to uh, use the body's own immune system to fight cancer have been there since uh, uh, Dr. Coley was at Memorial Sloan Kettering in the early 1900s. And uh, was trying and developed the Coley's toxin uh, because of some of the observations he had made on his patients. And we have, uh, since I landed in this country in 1977, I worked a lot in immune therapies. We were using things like BCG, uh, hyperthermia, all sorts of things. So there are many kinds of immune therapies. Most recently, two have become very much talked about, which one is called checkpoint inhibitors and the other is called uh, cell therapies, like CAR-Ts. The problem with all of these therapies is, let's talk about checkpoint inhibitors. They have made fabulous, uh, um, they have produced fabulous benefit in a number of patients, but too few and it's not curative. Mm -hmm. So what a cell, a cancer cell, uh, every cell has signals on its surface outside which either says eat me or don't eat me. <laughs> cancer cells are very clever. They, one reason we can't distinguish them from normal cells is because they are expressing all the normal markers, but they shut off some of the ones. Like eat me marker is shut off. So now, cancer cell cannot be detected by the immune system because there is nothing telling it the immune system to eat it. So these checkpoint inhibitors unravel and turn that back on. And the immune system kills them. But eventually, some cells escape and will come back and cause. 
However, using these therapies, uh, for example, in melanoma, dramatic uh, advances have occurred and uh, improvement in survival has occurred. For lung cancer patients, uh, non-small cell lung cancer, stage 4 disease, living much longer now, 20% of the patients at least because of these checkpoint inhibitors. So yes, this is very important. CAR T therapy, so in, in CAR T we take a T cell from the body which is an immune cell and we basically put a, uh, an address on this cell and it goes and finds that whichever cell is expressing this zip code, it will go and kill that specifically. The problem we have right now with CAR-T, which is curative for acute lymphoid leukemia, especially in children, and also some forms of lymphoma, the problem is that, again, these CAR-T cells cannot distinguish between a normal and a cancer cell, so they kill the whole organ. So CAR-T, when it is used for acute lymphoblastic leukemia, it kills every B cell in the body, even normal ones. <clears throat> then we have to replace the function of that normal B cell by giving immunoglobulins for the rest of the patient's life. Now this is one of my pet peeves, by the way. Hmm. Every morning when I'm trampolining, <laughs> I watch YouTube videos of all my colleagues who are speaking around the country. Mm. And especially immune therapy guys. They are so good at patting themselves on the back and talking about the great science that led to it, which is all true. It's beautiful science. The engineering that has been done to develop these CAR T cells, it's all really a huge, tremendous success of science and of human imagination. But no one ever says that these CAR T cells are incapable of just finding cancer cells to kill. No one. Had you ever heard this before? Yes. That they, this is why eight years ago, the first CAR T cells were given. Today, why don't we have something for pancreatic cancer? Because these cells will go kill the entire pancreas. That's the problem. Normal and abnormal cells. Besides that, Preparation of these cells is extremely expensive. It is financially ruining the healthcare system even to treat 7,000 patients a year who are the only eligible ones. 7,000 out of 1.7 million. This is what we are talking about. We are developing extremely expensive therapies costing 1, 1.5 million dollars with such toxicities that huge industries are arising just to control the side effects. Mm -hmm. And they don't, are not successful in every patient. And they're only good for 7,000 patients to begin with, even to try on them. So what about the rest of the world then, Kendra? Mm -hmm. The whole world looks to America for leadership. Is this a leadership? Mm -hmm. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, uh, one last question, and that is for you. Um, yes. uh, wait, she's bringing you the sure. mic. Thank you. Thank you so much, Azra. I, I, it's, I'm so glad that I was able to make it here today. You, one of the, uh, as you all have attested, one of our brilliant and um, most respected members, also of the Pakistani American community, and so for that. Uh, those of us who, who share part of that uh, heritage are very proud of her. Um, I'm just curious, uh, Azra, I mean, you, and you've mentioned this too, Kendra, that there are, this is several books in one, and one part of it is, seems to be this, or, or is, in fact, a critique of big business and pharma, right? Big pharma. And so I'm curious what, if any, has been a, a kind of a, a, a backlash or critique from pharmaceutical industries, particularly to some of what you might be saying here, which is a resounding critique of where the asking questions like, you know, where has all the money really gone and why? And, um, and also, it seems to me, you're suggesting a, a kind of a, 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 an approach which is simpler almost, uh, 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 you know? And so it, it's, it, it's, 
it's a contrast to this kind of let's go for the biggest and the best, and, and you're asking some very basic questions. So I'm, I just would love to know some of the reception and the critique that has come your way and how you, you know, how that's affected you or how you're answering it. Thank you. Again, a very important question you're asking for here, but I have uh, been indiscriminate in my criticism. Mm. Meaning it's not just targeting the pharmaceutical industry. I just told you about the cancer centers who are making big profits. Uh, the way the system works in America for research is that somebody like me, I'm a researcher at Columbia University, I'll apply for a grant to NIH, I will get a grant funded if I'm lucky, and then I make a discovery in my lab that I think is good, which is going to lead to drug development. But I can't do the drug development the next part because that requires hundreds of millions of dollars. And the NIH grants are only $250,000 a year for three years. Mm -hmm. So where do I get $100 million to do the trial? I have to now partner with industry. So we have to give up. So industry doesn't end up doing as much as research and development. We do all that work. The government funds it. And then they take it over. And then they develop the drugs. Mm -hmm. But they, from point zero, they have only one and one goal, which is to make money. Mm -hmm. That is their stated goal. Why are we going to criticize them? What did we give them, mm -hmm. first of all? What were the preclinical platforms that we used to develop those targets which we are asking the industry to now attack? So I don't just uh, criticize them. The other thing is that when we were sequencing the human genome, it took us 15 years to mm. do one genome and $2.7 billion. Think about it, 15 years. Today, 20 years later, it's like two weeks and a few hundred dollars. Wow. This is the beauty of capitalism also. Mm -hmm. The competition led to this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm asking for is that we need the kind of competition here that existed in the space race. Mm -hmm. That the best minds came to really compete. But as somebody very wise has said, that if you want things to change incrementally you compete, but if you want them to change in quantum leaps, then you cooperate. Mm -hmm. So I'm asking for the kind of cooperation that happened throughout the world to do the human genome sequencing, mm -hmm. and the kind of competition that was the moonshot, and use the capitalist system. All I'm saying is, instead of having the goal of going after the last cell, let's set a new goal, go after the first cell. As soon as we financially incentivize this goal, everybody and their grandmother will come to pay for that. And we can turn over the whole paradigm overnight. Why I say this is because we would never Half the people in this room, especially anyone under the age of 30, would not even remember what's a typewriter. <laughs> Why? Because the word processor came and it made that obsolete overnight. So if we kept tinkering with the typewriter, we would never get to the word processor. But I'm saying that uh, the pharmaceutical industry will love me because right now they only have 1.7 million cancer patients as their clients. But if we go after the first cell, they will have 350 million people in this country who will be their clients. So the whole idea is not, we shouldn't be discouraged. And I don't really want to target uh, pharmaceutical industry because they are, they are at least honest. This is their goal. They have to make money somehow for their shareholders. But what about us? I'm criticizing us more, more than anyone else, that why aren't we looking at the problem in an honest way instead of mollycoddling the public, instead of using these smoke and mirrors to keep acting as if great advances have occurred in cancer treatment? No. Mm. Only advances are due to early detection mm. and due to, um, <coughs> to action taken at that point so that we are saving more and more lives. 
And I think, uh, I hope I'll end with, uh, with, with telling you this little thing by a poem by Emily Dickinson, which is so, so beautifully said. Surgeons must be very careful when they test the knife. We began the cancer story by talking about this slash, poison, burn. Let me end with this. Surgeons must be very careful when they test the knife. Underneath their fine incisions rests the culprit, life. Mm-hmm. <laughs>